Paul VI was the man who claimed to be the head of the Catholic Church from June 21, 1963 to August 6, 1978. He was the man who promulgated the heretical Second Vatican Council and the New Mass. In our video, Vatican II Council of Apostasy, we showed what happened in the papal conclaves of 1958 and 1963, from which John XXIII and Paul VI emerged, claiming to be the elected popes. We showed that other cardinals were lawfully elected pope before John XXIII and Paul VI were elected. Evidence of this fact has been admitted by a cardinal who participated in the conclaves, a prominent Vatican insider, newspaper reports, and former intelligence agents. In the video Vatican II Council of Apostasy, we also showed that the documents of Vatican II contain many heresies. Paul VI solemnly ratified all 16 documents of Vatican II. It is not possible for a true pope of the Roman Catholic Church to solemnly ratify teachings that are heretical. The fact that Paul VI did solemnly ratify the heretical teachings of Vatican II proves that Paul VI was not a true pope, but an anti-pope. The Catholic Church has had about 40 anti-popes in church history. An anti-pope is an uncanonically elected quote pope, that is a person claiming to be pope who has not been legally elected. The Catholic Church has also infallibly taught that a heretic cannot be a true pope. The reason for this is that a pope is a member of the church and the visible head of the church, but a heretic places himself outside the church and ceases to be a member of the church. Thus, a heretic cannot be the pope because one who is outside cannot be the head of the church. This is why the Code of Canon Law, Pope Innocent III, Pope Paul IV, St. Francis de Sales, St. Alphonsus, and St. Robert Bellarmine all teach that a heretic cannot be a pope, and that if a true pope were to become a manifest heretic, he would cease to be the pope. This teaching is rooted in the infallible dogma that a heretic is not a member of the church. St. Robert Bellarmine, Cardinal and Doctor of the Church, a pope who is a manifest heretic automatically ceases to be pope and head just as he ceases automatically to be a Christian and a member of the church, wherefore he can be judged and punished by the church. This is the teaching of all the ancient fathers, who teach that manifest heretics immediately lose all jurisdiction. So even if one claims to be a priest, a bishop, or a pope, if he has become a manifest heretic, he has lost authority to rule as a leader of the true church because he has ceased to be a Catholic. St. Robert Bellarmine, this principle is most certain. The non-Christian cannot in any way be Pope, as Cayetan himself admits. The reason for this is that he cannot be head of what he is not a member. Now he who is not a Christian is not a member of the church, and a manifest heretic is not a Christian, as is clearly taught by St. Cyprian, St. Athanasius, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, and others. Therefore, the manifest heretic cannot be Pope. And how do we judge that someone is a heretic? St. Robert Bellarmine, For men are not bound or able to read hearts, but when they see that someone is a heretic by his external works, they judge him to be a heretic pure and simple, and condemn him as a heretic. Remember this fact. Paul VI was the person who gave the world the new mass, the other new sacraments, and the heretical teachings of Vatican II. If you go to the new mass, or embrace the teachings of Vatican II, the confidence that you have that these things are legitimate is directly connected to the confidence that you have that Paul VI was a true Catholic Pope. This video will expose the amazing heresies of Paul VI. This video will show from his official speeches and writings that he was a complete apostate who was not even remotely Catholic. All of the official speeches and writings of the men who claim to be Pope are contained in the Vatican's weekly newspaper, La Zervatura Romano. The Vatican has reprinted issues of their newspaper from April 4, 1968 to the present. I have personally gone through every weekly issue of the Vatican's official weekly newspaper from April 4, 1968 to present. From that research mainly, I will now prove that Paul VI was not a true pope, 
because of the irrefutable and undeniable evidence that he was a complete heretic and an apostate. Paul VI General Audience, December 6, 1972. Does God exist? Who is God? And what knowledge can man have of him? What relationship must each of us have with him? To answer these questions would lead us to endless and complex discussions. These questions don't lead us to endless and complex discussions. Does God exist? Yes. Who is God? The Holy Trinity. What knowledge can man have of him? The Catholic faith. What relationship must each of us have with him to belong to the church he established? Paul VI is blasphemously stating that these things are endless and complex questions. No Catholic would ever assert such nonsense, which mocks and renders meaningless the Catholic faith and the true God. Paul VI General Audience, June 27, 1973. Everything must change. Everything must progress. Evolution seems to be the law that brings liberation. There must be a great deal that is true and good in this mentality. Here, Paul VI explicitly states and approves the modernist blasphemy, that everything is in a state of evolution. His heresy was explicitly condemned by Pope Pius X. Pope Pius X, Pesceni, number 26, September 8, 1907, explaining the doctrine of the modernists. To the laws of evolution, everything is subject. Dogma, church, worship, the books we revere as sacred, even faith itself. Paul VI on non-Christian religions. The Catholic Church teaches that all non-Catholic religions are false. There is only one true church, outside of which no one can be saved. This is Catholic dogma. Pope St. Gregory the Great. The Holy Universal Church teaches that it is not possible to worship God truly, except in her, and asserts that all who are outside of her will not be saved. All of the other religions belong to the devil. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church, and sacred scripture. See 1 Corinthians 10 verse 20 and Psalm 95 verse 5. Anyone who shows esteem for non-Christian religions, or regards them as good, or deserving of respect, denies Jesus Christ and is an apostate. Pope Pius XI, Mortalium Animos, number 2, January 6, 1928. That false opinion which considers all religions to be more or less good and praiseworthy. Not only are those who hold this opinion in error and deceived, but also in distorting the idea of true religion, they reject it. Here's what Paul VI thought about non-Christian religions of the devil. Paul VI addressed September 22, 1973. Noble non-Christian religions. This is apostasy, a total rejection of Jesus Christ. Paul VI, General Audience, January 12, 1972. A disconcerting picture opens up before our eyes, that of religions, the religions invented by man, attempts that are sometimes extremely daring and noble. Here Paul VI says that religions invented by man are sometimes extremely noble. This is apostasy, a total rejection of Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith. Paul VI message, December 6, 1977. Non-Christian religions, which the church respects and esteems. He is saying that he esteems false religions. In his address, August 22, 1969, Paul VI praised the Hindu Gandhi and stated that he was, quote, ever conscious of God's presence. Hindus are pagans and idolaters who worship many different false gods. For Paul VI to praise the notorious Hindu Gandhi as ever conscious of God's presence shows again that Paul VI was a complete apostate. Paul VI also officially praised the false religion of Hinduism in the official Vatican II document, Nostri Aetate No. 2 on non-Christian religions. Paul VI Apostolic Exhortation, December 8, 1975. The Church respects and esteems these non-Christian religions. Notice again, Paul VI esteems false religions. This is purely satanic. Paul VI address, August 24, 1974. Religious and cultural differences in India, as you have said, are honored and respected. We are pleased to see that this mutual honor and esteem is practiced. Paul VI says that religious differences are honored in India, and that he is pleased to see this. 
This means that he honors the worship of false gods. Paul VI addressed a synod of bishops September 2, 1974. Likewise, we cannot omit a reference to the non-Christian religions. These, in fact, must no longer be regarded as rivals or obstacles to evangelization. Here, Paul VI boldly reveals that he is preaching a new gospel. Non-Christian religions, he tells us, are no longer our obstacle to evangelization. This is an anti-Christ religion of apostasy. Pope Gregory XVI, Mararivos No. 13, August 15, 1832. They should consider the testimony of Christ himself, that those who are not with Christ are against him, and that they disperse unhappily who do not gather with him. Therefore, without a doubt, they will perish forever unless they hold the Catholic faith whole and inviolate. Paul VI addressed to Dalai Lama September 30, 1973. We are happy to welcome your holiness today. You come to us from Asia, the cradle of ancient religions and human traditions which are rightly held in deep veneration. Paul VI tells us that it is right to hold these false religions which worship false gods in deep veneration. Thus, Paul VI worshipped the false gods of these religions, and he was encouraging others to worship them as well by respecting such idolatry. Paul VI address, August 1969. Uganda includes differing faiths which respect and esteem one another. This again is total apostasy. Paul VI message to pagan Shinto priests, March 3rd, 1976. We know the fame of your temple and the wisdom that is represented so vividly by the images contained therein. This may be the most evil, revealing, and heretical statement that the apostate Paul VI ever uttered. He is praising the wisdom contained in the images in the pagan Shinto temple. In other words, he is praising the idols of the Shintoists themselves. Paul VI on Buddhism. Buddhism is a false pagan religion of the East, which believes in reincarnation and karma. Buddhists hold that life is not worth living, and that every form of conscious existence is an evil. Buddhists worship various false gods, Buddhism is a disgusting, idolatrous, and false religion of the devil. Here is what Paul VI thought about Buddhism. Paul VI General Audience to Japanese Buddhists, September 5, 1973. It is a great pleasure for us to welcome the members of the Japanese Buddhist Europe Tour, honored followers of the Sotu Shu sect of Buddhism. At the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic Church exhorted her sons and daughters to study and evaluate the religious traditions of mankind and to learn by sincere and patient dialogue what treasures a bountiful God has distributed among the nations of the earth. Buddhism is one of the riches of Asia. According to Paul VI, the false pagan and idolatrous religion of Buddhism is one of the riches of Asia. Paul VI speech to Buddhist spiritual leader January 17, 1975. The Second Vatican Council has expressed sincere admiration for Buddhism in its various forms. We wish your holiness and all your faithful an abundance of prosperity and peace. Notice his idolatry and total apostasy in admiring the false religion of Buddhism. Paul VI addressed June 5, 1972, Speech to Buddhists. It is with great cordiality and esteem that we greet so distinguished a group of Buddhist leaders from Thailand. We have a profound regard for your precious traditions. Paul VI to a group of Buddhist leaders, June 15, 1977. To the distinguished group of Buddhist leaders from Japan, we bid a warm welcome. The Second Vatican Council declared that the Catholic Church looks with sincere respect on your way of life. On this occasion, we are happy to recall the words of St. John. The world, with all it craves for, is coming to an end, but anyone who does the will of God remains forever. He first says that the Catholic Church looks with respect upon the Buddhist way of life. This is apostasy. Then he says that on this occasion we must recall the words of St. John, anyone who does the will of God remains forever. This clearly means that Buddhists will live forever, that is, be saved. This is total apostasy. Paul VI addressed a Buddhist patriarch of Laos, June 8, 1973. Buddhism, the Catholic Church considers its spiritual riches with esteem 
and respects and wishes to collaborate with you as religious men to bring about real peace and the salvation of man. Paul VI says that the Catholic Church considers with esteem the spiritual riches of the false religion of Buddhism. He then says that he wishes to collaborate with the Buddhist patriarch to bring about the salvation of man. This is apostasy. Paul VI on Islam. Islam is a false religion which denies the divinity of Christ and rejects the most holy trinity. Besides rejecting the true God, Islam allows polygamy up to four wives, and its followers, Muslims, spread this false religion with a zeal unequaled by the others. Islam is the most viciously anti-Christian major false religion in the world, for to convert to Christianity in many Islamic countries means death and the propagation of the true faith is strictly prohibited. Islamic society is one of the most evil things in human history. Here's what Paul VI thought about this false religion which rejects Christ and the Trinity. Paul VI speech, September 9, 1972. We would also like you to know that the church recognizes the riches of the Islamic faith, a faith that binds us to the one God. Here he is speaking about the riches of the Islamic faith, a faith that rejects Jesus Christ and the Trinity. He says this, quote, faith binds us to the one God. This is apostasy. Paul VI addressed September 18, 1969. Moslems, along with us, adore the one and merciful God, who on the last day will judge mankind. Moslems don't worship the one true God, the Holy Trinity, together with Catholics. This is apostasy, and Muslims certainly don't worship God who will judge mankind on the last day, Jesus Christ. Paul VI addressed a Muslim ambassador June 4, 1976. Moroccan Muslims are brothers in faith in the one God. You will always be made very welcome, and you will find esteem and understanding here. He says that Muslims will always find esteem at the Vatican. This means that Paul VI esteems the false religion of Islam. Paul VI addressed December 2, 1977. The Muslims who profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day, as the Second Vatican Council solemnly declared. Paul VI addressed August 1969. Our lively desire to greet in your persons, the great Muslim community spread throughout Africa. You thus enable us to manifest here our high respect for the faith you profess. In recalling the Catholic and Anglican martyrs, we gladly recall also those confessors of the Muslim faith who were the first to suffer death. He mentions his high respect for the false faith of Islam, and he commemorates Muslims who witness to this false religion through death. This is total apostasy. Paul VI Angelus Address, August 3, 1969. Twenty-two martyrs were recognized, but there were many more, and not only Catholics. There were also Anglicans and some Mohammedans. This is the most heretical statement we've ever seen regarding the heresy that there are non-Catholic martyrs. For he says that Muslims, who don't even believe in Christ or the Trinity, are martyrs, in addition to Anglicans. Amazing. Pope Eugene IV, Council of Florence, 1441, ex cathedra. Nobody can be saved, no matter how much he has given away in alms, and even if he has shed blood in the name of Christ, unless he has persevered in the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. Pope Eugene IV, Council of Florence, Dogmatic Athanasian Creed, 1439. Whoever wishes to be saved needs above all to hold the Catholic faith, unless each one preserves this whole and inviolate, he will without a doubt perish in eternity. Paul VI on the quote Orthodox. The Eastern Orthodox are schismatics who reject papal infallibility and the last 13 general councils of the Catholic Church. They reject that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the second person of the Trinity. They permit divorce and remarriage, and many of them reject the Immaculate Conception. Here's what Paul VI thought of these schismatics. Paul VI, speech April 19, 1970, speaking of the deceased schismatic patriarch of Moscow. To the very end, he was conscious and solicitous for his great ministry. He says that leadership in a schismatic church is a great ministry. 
Paul VI addressed January 24, 1972. Greet among us an eminent representative of the Venerable Orthodox Church, a man of great piety. Paul VI speech January 23, 1972. The Great Venerable and Excellent Orthodox Patriarch. Paul VI addressed a schismatic delegation June 27, 1977. Then, ten years later, we paid a visit to your holy church. Paul VI General Audience January 20, 1971. The Venerable Eastern Orthodox Churches. He says that the schismatic churches are venerable. Paul VI speaking of the death of the schismatic patriarch, Athenagoras, July 9, 1972. We recommend this great man to you, a man of a venerated church. Paul VI address May 25, 1968, the Venerable Orthodox Church of Bulgaria. Paul VI common declaration with Patriarch of Syrian Schismatic Sect, October 27, 1971. This should be done with love, with openness to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and with mutual respect for each other and each other's church. So Paul VI respects the rejection of the papacy and papal infallibility. Paul VI telegram upon election of new schismatic patriarch of Constantinople, July 1972. At the moment when you assume a heavy charge in the service of the Church of Christ. This means that the schismatic church is the Church of Christ. Paul VI addressed December 14, 1976. Very dear brother, sent by the Venerable Church of Constantinople, we carried out the solemn and sacred ecclesial act of lifting the ancient anathemas, an act with which we wish to remove the memory of these events forever from the memory and the heart of the church. The schismatic orthodox are anathematized by the church for denying the papacy and not accepting the dogmas of the Catholic faith, but Paul VI solemnly lifted these anathemas against them. This means that Paul VI attempted to overturn the papacy as a dogma, which must be believed under pain of anathema. Paul VI Letter to Schismatic, November 1976, the first Pan-Orthodox Conference, in preparation for the Great Holy Council of the Orthodox Churches, is beginning its work for the best service of the Venerable Orthodox Church. He calls the Schismatic Council holy and the Schismatic Church venerable. Paul VI was a Schismatic. Paul VI Joint Declaration with the Schismatic Quote Pope Shenouda III, May 10, 1973. Paul VI, Bishop of Rome and Pope of the Catholic Church, and Shenouda III, Pope of Alexandria and Patriarch of the See of St. Mark, in the name of this charity, we reject all forms of proselytism. Let it cease where it may exist. This is all one really needs to see to know that Paul VI was a schismatic and not a Catholic. He makes a joint declaration with a schismatic, quote, Pope. He acknowledges this schismatic as the holder of the See of St. Mark, which is a blasphemy against the papacy and the church, since this schismatic holds no authority whatsoever, and he rejects all forms of proselytism, that is, trying to convert these schismatics, and he says, let it cease where it may exist. He could not be more of a formal heretic and a schismatic. Pope Leo XIII, Satis Cognitum, number 13, June 29, 1896. You are not to be looked upon as holding the true Catholic faith if you do not teach that the faith of Rome is to be held. Pope Bank XIV, July 26, 1755. First, the missionary who is attempting with God's help to bring back Greek and Eastern schismatics to unity should devote all his effort to the single objective of delivering them from doctrines at variance with the Catholic faith. Pope Benedict XIV, for the only work entrusted to the missionary is that of recalling the Oriental to the Catholic faith. Paul VI on other Protestant sects. Protestantism began with the German priest Martin Luther, who left the Catholic Church and started the Protestant Revolution in 1517. Luther denied free will the papacy, praying to the saints, purgatory, tradition, transubstantiation, and the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Luther replaced the Mass with a memorial service commemorating the Last Supper. All the sacraments except baptism and the Holy Eucharist were rejected. Luther held that after the fall of Adam, man cannot produce any good works. Most Protestants hold the same beliefs as Luther, but all of them reject numerous Catholic dogmas. 
Here's what Paul VI thought of these heretics and schismatics. Paul VI, Angelus Address, January 17, 1971. From polemical opposition among the various Christian denominations, we have passed to mutual respect. Here, Paul VI reveals that the Vatican II agenda with regard to Protestant sects has gone from polemical opposition, in other words, an opposition to their false doctrines, to an attitude of acceptance of and mutual respect for their false religion. Pope Pius IV, Profession of Faith, Council of Trent, ex cathedra. This true Catholic faith, outside of which no one can be saved, I now profess and truly hold. Paul VI speaking of the death of the Protestant Martin Luther King Jr., April 7, 1968. We shall all share the hopes which his martyrdom inspires in us. Pope Gregory XVI, May 27, 1832. Finally, some of these misguided people attempt to persuade themselves and others that men are not saved only in the Catholic religion, but that even heretics may attain eternal life. Paul VI on birth control. Paul VI favored birth control. Paul VI speech, November 16, 1970. This, among other effects, will undoubtedly favor a rational control of birth by couples. Paul VI address, August 24, 1969. The liberty of husband and wife does not forbid them a moral and reasonable limitation of birth. Paul VI encyclical, Humanae Vitae, number 16, July 25, 1968. It cannot be denied that in each case the married couple, for acceptable reasons, are both perfectly clear in their intention to avoid children and wish to make sure that none will result. Paul VI says that couples are perfectly free to have zero children if they want to. Paul VI on the United Nations. The United Nations is an evil organization that promotes contraception, abortion, and looks to take control of the decision-making for every country on the planet. Former UN Secretary General Yu Thant praised the communist Lenin as a man whose, quote, ideals were reflected in the United Nations Charter. Here's what Paul VI thought of the UN. Paul VI addressed February 5, 1972. We have faith in the UN. Paul VI message, April 26, 1968. May all men of heart join together peacefully in order that the principles of the United Nations may be not only proclaimed, but put into effect, and that not only the constitutions of states may promulgate them, but public authorities apply them. Paul VI message to president of a UN conference, May 1976. This new international economic order that has to be ceaselessly built up. Paul VI message, September 8, 1977. Stress is legitimately laid nowadays on the necessity of constructing a new world order. Paul VI message to United Nations, May 24, 1978. We are aware that the path which must lead to the coming of a new international order cannot in any case be assured as we would like it to be. Disarmament, a new world order, and development are three obligations that are inseparably bound together. Paul VI and the Worship of Man Paul VI Address, February 7, 1971 All honor then to man. Paul VI Address, August 1, 1969 Do not let yourselves become discouraged by the obstacles and difficulties that constantly arise. Do not lose faith in man. Paul VI Message, March 25, 1971 Man to whom all things on earth should be related as their center and crown. Paul VI speech, November 18, 1971. On our visit to Bombay, we emphasize, man must meet man. Paul VI audience, January 10, 1972. For the demands of justice, gentlemen, can only be gathered in the light of truth, that truth which is man. This means that man is the truth. Paul VI Address, April 11, 1973. Always anxious to safeguard, above everything else, the primacy of man. In his Angelus Address, January 27, 1974, Paul VI spoke positively of, quote, the cult of man for man's sake. Paul VI Address, February 15, 1974. As Your Excellency has rightly recalled, that the final aim is man. 
Paul VI addressed December 29, 1968, the Christian mystery which rests on man. Paul VI audience April 28, 1969, in the final analysis there are no true riches but man. Paul VI Angelus Address, July 20th, 1969. We would do well to meditate on man. Paul VI Address, October 16th, 1976. If the gospel is for man, we Christians are completely for the gospel. Notice that he only says that we are for the gospel if the gospel is for man. Paul VI Address, December 4th, 1976. Above all ideological conditionings, the greatness and dignity of the human person must emerge as the only value to promote and defend. Paul VI's Christmas message, December 25, 1976. Let us honor fallen and sinful humanity. Paul VI's speech, June 10, 1969. For in the final analysis, there is no true riches but the riches of man. Paul VI on Christmas. Paul VI, General Audience, December 17, 1969. Christmas is the birthday of life, of our life. Christmas is the birthday of Jesus Christ. It is not the birthday of our life, because we are not Jesus Christ. But this is what Paul VI is preaching. Paul VI, Angelus Address, December 21, 1974. A Merry Christmas to you. It is the feast of human life. Paul VI Christmas Message, December 25, 1976. Brethren, let us honor in the birth of Christ the incipient life of man. The word incipient means beginning, in an initial stage. So Paul VI is saying that in the birth of Christ we find the beginning stages of the life of man. This clearly means that man is Christ. Paul VI Angelus Message, December 18, 1976. Christmas is a feast of mankind, dedicated as a happy effect to honor human existence. Paul VI preaching that man is God. Paul VI message, December 20th, 1968. We live in the era of hope. It is, however, a hope in the kingdom of this earth, a hope in human self-sufficiency. According to Paul VI, the hope is not in God or his kingdom, but in human self-sufficiency. Paul VI, General Audience, August 16, 1972. Man is master of himself. He is free who is the cause of himself. Man is not the cause of himself. God creates man. Paul VI, Speech, September 12, 1970. The only word which explains man is God himself made man, the word made flesh. This clearly means that man is God himself made man, our Lord Jesus Christ. Pope Pius X, E Supreme Apostolatus, October 4th, 1903. The distinguishing mark of Antichrist. Man has with infinite temerity put himself in the place of God. Other changes made by Paul VI. On November 13th, 1964, Paul VI gave away the triple crown papal tiara. Paul VI had the tiara auction at the New York World's Fair. The papal tiara is a sign of a true pope's authority. The three crowns representing the dogmatic, liturgical, and disciplinary authority of a pope. By giving it away, Paul VI was symbolically giving away the authority of the papacy, although he had none to give away since he was actually an anti-pope. But it was a symbolic act of how he was a satanic infiltrator whose whole mission was to attempt to destroy the Catholic Church. Paul VI was also seen many times wearing the breastplate of the ephod, also known as the rationale of judgment of a Jewish high priest. Notice the 12 stones which represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Not only is this the breastplate of a Jewish high priest, but according to the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry by Mackey, the ephod is also, quote, worn in the Masonic American chapters of the Royal Arch by the High Priest as an official part of his official ornaments. The ephod was the vestment that was worn by Caiaphas, the High Priest of the Jewish religion, who ordered our Lord Jesus Christ to be put to death by crucifixion. Anti-Pope Paul VI wore the breastplate of the ephod, also known as the rationale of judgment of the High Priest, numerous times. God allows things such as this to come out to show the people that this man was an infiltrator 
and an enemy of the Catholic Church. Anti-Pope Paul VI was the man who authoritatively implemented the false Second Vatican Council, changed the Catholic Mass into a Protestant service, and changed the rite of every single sacrament. He changed the matter or form of the Eucharist, extreme unction, holy orders, and confirmation. Anti-Pope Paul VI wanted to put Christ to death in the Mass by removing it and replacing it with a counterfeit and wanted to kill his Catholic Church by attempting to change the Church completely. Within two years of the close of Vatican II, Paul VI removed the Index of Forbidden Books, a decision one commentator rightly called incomprehensible. Paul VI then abolished the Oath Against Modernism at a time when modernism was flourishing as never before. Paul VI disestablished the Papal Court disbanded the Noble Guard and the Palatine Guards. Paul VI abolished the Rite of Tonsure, all four minor orders and the rank of subdiaconate. Paul VI removed solemn exorcisms from the baptismal rite. In the place of the solemn exorcisms, he substituted an optional prayer that makes only a passing reference to fighting the devil. Paul VI granted more than 32,000 requests from priests who had asked to be released from their vows and returned to the lay status, the greatest exodus from the priesthood since the Reformation. Paul VI's disastrous influence was visible immediately. For example, in Holland, not a single candidate applied for admission to the priesthood in 1970, and within 12 months, every seminary there was closed. Spiritual destruction was everywhere. Countless millions left the church, Countless others ceased practicing the faith and confessing their sins. And while Paul VI was the cause of this unrelenting disaster and spiritual destruction, like the sly serpent he was, he calculatingly misdirected the attention away from himself. And perhaps his most famous quote, he noted that Satan's smoke had made its way into the temple of God. Paul VI homily, June 29, 1972. Satan's smoke has made its way into the temple of God through some crack. When Paul VI made this statement, everyone looked at the cardinals, the bishops, and the priests to discover where this smoke of Satan might be. They looked at everyone except the man who made the statement, but Paul VI was actually the smoke of Satan, and he made the statement to misdirect people away from himself, which he was successful in doing. And what is perhaps most frightening is that Paul VI's famous statement is basically a direct reference to Apocalypse 9 verses 1 through 3. And there was given to him the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and the smoke of the pit arose, as the smoke of a great furnace. In Apocalypse 9 we see a direct reference to the smoke of Satan, and as someone who is given the key to unleash it. Anti-Pope Paul VI did not have the keys of Peter, but he was given the key to the bottomless pit. He was the one who brought in the smoke of Satan from the great furnace, as he says, from some crack. Jean Guiton, an intimate friend of Paul VI, related what Paul VI said at the final session of Vatican II. It was the final session of the council, Guiton wrote, the most essential in which Paul VI was to bestow on all humanity the teachings of the Council. He announced this to me on that day with these words, I am about to blow the seven trumpets of the Apocalypse. Paul VI speech to Lombard Seminary, December 7, 1968. The Church finds herself in an hour of disquiet, of self-criticism, one might say even of self-destruction. The Church is wounding herself. Here, anti-Pope Paul VI again mocks the people. He says the church is in, quote, self-destruction and is, quote, wounding herself. He is referring to himself again, for he was the one trying to destroy her and wound her at every turn. Paul VI's belief in magic. The Oxford Illustrated Dictionary defines magic as, quote, pretended art of influencing events by occult control of nature or of spirits, witchcraft. Catholics are forbidden to practice magic, but Paul VI promoted magic. Paul VI homily, November 12, 1972. Where does it come from, this interior magic that banishes fear? Paul VI general audience, December 30, 1970. Invisible but overpowering magic of the flood of public opinion. 
Paul VI's message, January 1st, 1975. Reconciliation. Could not this magic word find a place in the dictionary of your hopes? Paul VI, homily, May 11th, 1975. You artists of the theater and cinema, who possess the magic art of offering with voice and with music the real-life scene of the event. Paul VI, speech, May 18th, 1969. Everything is transformed under the magical influence of science. Paul VI, message to Brazilian people, February 1972. Service, a magic word that galvanizes into action. Paul VI, address, June 23rd, 1973. The religious root seems to have lost so much of its magical power of inspiration. Why does Paul VI speak so much about magic? It is precisely because he knows that it was black magic that allowed him, a satanic infiltrator, to fool the world into thinking that he was a pope, so that he could then try to destroy the mass and almost the entire Catholic Church. He knows that it was black magic that allowed him to get away with changing the right to every sacrament and foisting his new Vatican II religion upon the world. Paul VI also had the strangest way of curling his peas in his signature, so that when you turn them upside down, you get three clear sixes. As far as we know, this is the way that Paul VI's signature always appeared. Paul VI admits his church is the whore of Babylon. In the Apocalypse chapters 17 and 18, there is predicted that a whore will arise in the last days from the city of seven hills, which is Rome. This whore will tread on the blood of the martyrs and saints, and it is clearly contrasted with the Immaculate Bride of Christ, the Catholic Church. In other words, the whore of Babylon will be a false church from Rome that will appear in the last days. In our material, we have demonstrated the evidence that this whore of Babylon is the Vatican II sect, a false bride, which arises in Rome in the last days in order to attempt to deceive the Catholic faithful. In her appearance at La Salette, France, September 19, 1846, the Blessed Mother predicted, quote, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. The church will be in eclipse. In the following quote, Antipope Paul VI admits his new church is this false church by admitting that his church has thrown off its opposition to the world, which characterizes the true church. Paul VI, General Audience, October 1st, 1969. On the other hand, she, the church, is also trying to adapt herself and assimilate herself to the world's ways. She is taking off her distinctive sacral garment, for she wants to feel more human and earthly. She is tending to let herself be absorbed by the social and temporal milieu. She has almost been seized by human respect at the thought that she is different in some way and obliged to have a style of thought and life which is not that of the world. She is undergoing the world's changes and degradations with conformist, almost avant-garde zeal. Here Paul VI admits that the post-Vatican II church is a false church which has adapted itself to the world and assimilated the world's ways with zeal. This is a stunning admission by Paul VI. He is admitting in so many words that the post-Vatican II church is the whore of Babylon. Paul VI death. After Paul VI death in 1978, there was no crucifix nor even a cross in the tomb when his body was placed for veneration in St. Peter's Square. It was simply a wooden box. And this is precisely how Jews are buried, in a plain wooden box. Here is a statement of a Jewish expert, quote, burial is a plain wooden casket with no metal. This incredible fact, in addition to his wearing of the Jewish ephod and all of his other systematic attempts to destroy all of Catholic tradition, shows again that anti-Pope Paul VI was a satanic Jewish infiltrator. In fact, Paul VI's ancestors were of Jewish origin. The Montini family are Jews and listed as such in the Golden Book of Noble Italian Heritage, 1962 to 1964, page 994. Quote, Montini was of Hebrew origin. We have proven in this video that Paul VI was a complete apostate, 
who believe that false religions are true, that heresy and schism are fine, and that schismatics should not be converted just to name a few. If you accept Vatican II or the new Mass or the new sacramental rites, in short, if you accept the Vatican II religion, this is the man whose religion you are following, a complete apostate who is not remotely Catholic, whose whole mission was to attempt to overturn and destroy as much of the Catholic faith as possible. Catholics must have no part with Paul VI's new Mass, the Novus Ordo, and must completely reject Vatican II and the new sacramental rites. Catholics must completely reject anti-Pope Paul VI for the apostate infiltrator that he was. Catholics must reject and not support any group which accepts this apostate as a pope or the new mass, Vatican II, or the new sacramental rites of Paul VI. The truth remains that the Catholic Church is the one church founded by Christ to which all must belong in order to be saved, and that this church still exists in a remnant of Catholics who maintain the infallible teachings of the true popes throughout history. St. Athanasius, even if Catholics faithful to tradition were reduced to a handful, they would be the true church. According to Father William Jurgens, during the Arian crisis in approximately 380 AD, Perhaps the number of Catholic bishops in possession of sees, as opposed to Arian bishops in possession of sees, was no greater than something between 1% and 3% of the total. Had doctrine been determined by popularity, today we should all be deniers of Christ and opponents of the Spirit. If the Arian heresy was so bad that approximately 1% of the jurisdictional bishops remained Catholic and 99% became Arian, and the great apostasy preceding the second coming of Christ is predicted to be even worse, the worst apostasy of all time, then one should not be surprised by the fact that there are very few Catholics in the world today who preserve the true faith, and that an anti-pope is reigning from Rome, as predicted by Our Lady of La Salette, and heading a counterfeit church of apostasy.